Yeah, so today I just wanted to try out a little video log here. And uh, the title is Can Buddhism Be Saved? Or American Buddhism? Can American baseball be saved? And can America be saved? So they kind of all tie in together. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the issue of politics, wokeness, leftoids in, in American Buddhism, it's been discussed extensively. So I don't really want to get into a long song and dance about it. I think everybody's trying to do their best. And, um, but, but I think there is some concern that people with uh, narrow worldly uh, political aims, which are, some of them are very noble. So that's why it's complicated, you know, justice for all, equality for all. I don't know. Some of these principles, uh, they're, they're good intentioned. But anyways, um, before we get back into that, so how did my introduction to Buddhism or how did I get involved with Buddhism? So in the 1970s, 70 to 74, I was up in uh, Burlington, Vermont, and I went to St. Michael's College. And uh, I went through a huge psychological turmoil, which is not, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, you know, to say I was a mess is not the right way. You know, it was a spiritual and just total rightness. A sense of uh, alienation was creeping in on me. You know, Vietnam was still, um, you know, still going on. We were getting out, but uh, but you know, Vietnam was a formative thing in the background. Uh, you know, during those years. And uh, and then my older brother got cancer. Uh, you know, there was just calamity after calamity. I was at the same time a pretty serious student of uh, philosophy at St. Michael's, you know, history of philosophy. Great stuff. Boy, I love St. Michael's. Anybody who thinks I'm, you know, I have some issues with St. Michael's, they're wrong. They're wrong. I, I now consider myself to have been... Uh, almost pulled by God to, to St. Michael's. Yeah. I look back now at the formative years with Cy Sloan, my art teacher, but uh, but I knew, I met uh, Henry Fairbanks. You know, Henry Fairbanks, he started a um, a program, a system of education in, in, in the liberal arts systems, you know, for humanities. You know the curricula of humanities, the structures of humanities program, and we can talk at length about it. But uh, but I met the great man, and he he was uh, he was like a Rousseau. Um, he had a he we had a I don't mean to get smalty here, but um, you know, and he wasn't amorous or anything, but you could tell that he really loved you, that he deeply cared. Uh, for Fairbanks, there were Friday night. Um, uh, really drink drinking sessions with the students. I mean, he was in the corner on a big sofa and we were all sort of like an amphitheater in his living room. And uh, it was 1971. It was like no other time. Like no other time. He was talking a lot about uh, Aldous Huxley's Island, the uh, which had some connotations with the 60s with hallucinogenic drugs, mind expansion, consciousness growth, and all of that. Uh, so those themes were in island. And uh, actually, a lot of Buddhist themes and Hindu, Hindu and Buddhist themes. Uh, Huxley was, you know, and that was part of the St. Michael's experience. You know, we, we, we were reading people like Huxley. But anyways, so how did I get it? So that summer, uh, after my first year of, uh, Things had gotten real bad. And uh, my parents were okay with me staying the summer and working as a, uh, as a, a waiter's assistant, what you call it. Uh, I took all, I, I picked up all the uh, used plates and dinner plates and busboy. Yeah, I was a busboy that summer. And it was a great job. And the old lady that ran the place, she loved me. It was just, you know, we were good. And, uh, Anyways, but, uh, you know, it sounds wonderful and idyllic, and believe me, it was beautiful. Those summers in Vermont, I spent many, many summers in Vermont. Um, uh, thank you, my parents. You know, they were really, you know, they were generous. They, they, they let, you know, they gave me the money to rent a hundred dollars a month or whatever. But back then, a hundred dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. But 
uh, but that summer, uh, I, I, the great event in my education occurred, and that was the course by uh, Alan Andrews at, at University of Vermont, the religion department. Alan is he's he was widely known as an expert on the um, really the the most important school if you speak in terms of numbers of people and uh, the most important school was the Pure Land and uh, in Japan especially of course he 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 would explain the historical connections with with China with the Amitabha practice the the, the Western land there's a heaven where there's this great Amitabha Buddha who will accept everybody. You don't have to be a monk or nun. You don't have to have any advanced uh, practices. If you just have faith in Amitabha, at your death, he will take you to this pure land. And then you can work on your karma, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, do some school, or, you know, and actually that's, that's what's so interesting about the pure land is that a lot of people think you just kind of hang up. No, you don't. You're studying. You study and then you advance. The individuation, the growth towards enlightenment continues full bore, you know, with no distractions and uh, ideal conditions. So, uh, you know, it'd be like going to Dharamsala and Lhasa and Kyoto uh, or and whatever, and, and living in that environment full time all material things taken care of. Uh, and that's, yeah, Pure Land is more like that. Anyways, but I didn't study Pure Land. Back then I was, you know, history of philosophy and, you know, what is reality? And, you know, Schopenhauer was my hero. I, I never trusted Nietzsche. I, I never got Nietzsche, actually. I have to be honest with you. I'm not that smart. But Schopenhauer, uh, he's, his will, the world, his will and idea, to me, is uh, one of our great Western classics. I'll, I'll say that again: "The World as Will and Idea" by Arthur Schopenhauer, and that—that's it for me. I can't, I couldn't go much further. But, uh, but that summer, um, I enrolled in this varieties of Buddhist meditation with Alan Andrews, and uh, so it, it was very solid. Really, more—it was almost not biased, but we spent the most time. With the Theravada breath Anapanasati, and then uh, and then the other major uh, thing we studied was the the Soto Zazen of Shikantaza, which is just sitting, and Philip Kaplow's presentation of the Mu Koan in China would be the Huado, uh, and the Huado Koan practice for me was natural. I just um, it was. The Mu Koan, I, I, you know, you're not supposed to talk about realization here, but, you know, when you read D.T. Suzuki, you know, he talks about, you know, we have many Kenshos. You can have many moments of openings, many moments, many, many, many. many. And, uh, you know, there's major Kenshos, major Satoris, okay? But, um, but that course, I had many Kenshos, many Kenshos. The, uh, and then it continued. I, I took another more uh, academic course of Buddhism there with Alan, and that was it. Two courses, and I was out. I was not a matriculated student there. I was still at St. Michael's. So these were more, you know, just going across town. Because, boy, it, it, St. Michael's did not teach Buddhism, which is a shame. When you think of the great work done by the Jesuit scholar on the history of Zen, I mean, uh, De Molin, I think he's, it's incredible. You know, and he, he's a Jesuit priest. So WTF St. Michael's, you know, I, I, this is shame on you. You know, you should have been, you had a real opportunity, you know, with your international English uh, programs in the summer. You could also develop uh, East Asian studies, you know, from a Catholic point of view, you know, with a Catholic point of view. I, to me, it's like, it's base hit, home run. But anyways, back to that summer, I uh, I had many problems. Yeah, and a lot of them were many personal, psychological, sexual kind of stuff, which we don't we're not getting into that. But but I can tell you that um, the Zen Buddhist style of meditation, you know, the, the strong good, you know, the strong good posture, and and working with the Mu Koan that summer um, was the turnaround. Because I was in bad shape. 
if things got much worse, I you know I really don't know what 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 would have happened. Yeah. So Buddhism, Zen Buddhism saved my life. So when I take when I tell people it saved my life, it saved my individual life, where I could go to school, I could get a job. So as soon after this, by the way, I uh, went into the Coast Guard military, and that was another. I was I did the MOOC call. I worked with I worked with Zen throughout the Coast Guard. Yeah, Zen was still my practice because it's so simple. You know, you're not getting caught up in a lot of, you know, complexity. You know, you 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 just you you work with the calm. What is move? Or you can do some breath, or you can just sit. Okay, and if you got the time, read Dogen, read Hakuen, you know, Shenyan, you know, Peggy G. U. Kennett. You know, there's all these great teachers in the West um, that are that are available. I like Michiru Roshi out in New Mexico. She's good. Yeah. She, she talks a little bit too much about personal history. A little little worrisome there, you know. I think we're supposed to get past that, but but uh, that's not a criticism. It's just that, you know, something's not something ain't right yet, uh, because you're talking about yourself. So, so speaking of talking about yourself, I'm gonna talk about me. So that's summer and then into the Coast Guard. And um yeah, it it really settled me down. And, uh, you know, knowing me, I think you'd be surprised. But the last thing was I reconnected with uh, with a really good, a good person that I knew in Vermont. And had, and we had kissed a couple of times. Yeah, we had, we, we had, we went to bed once. It wasn't very good. It wasn't very good at that time. But all I knew was I liked her. I really liked her. Yeah, she was, uh, you know, she was Swedish American. Her father was of German descent. Her mother was like a knockout blonde Swede. And Hetty, Hetty was beautiful. Uh, look, my, my wife was probably one of the most, in, in her time, at that age, she was probably, when she walked into a room, she was the most beautiful woman there. And uh, and Hetty had elegance too. You know, she 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 went to Manhattan uh, for uh, that college, uh, I think the sister the sister college. I don't know. Anyways, um, yeah, Zen Zen continued to keep me grounded enough where I could actually have a really physical full marriage lifestyle. Yeah. And it was it was good for a while, yeah. And uh, and then after three four years, the vitality, the energy, the beauty really really dipped with Hetty. I uh, I I don't know what happened. I uh, I'm probably partially responsible. Yeah, these deep karmic things are uh, they're deep. They're deep. Not karmic between us, but just our individual tendencies, our attitudes, um, you know, what we're bringing with us, our upbringing and stuff. And I'm sure that all contributed seriously. But in any event, uh, Hetty came down with cancer, um, and we really, we really were in agreement. That even after after seeing His Holiness talk about it's okay to get divorced, we both heard the same message, and. Um, and so we were ready to split. I was really going in a different direction. You know, I was going back to the single man, you know, the single man lifestyle, um, strong, strong work with Zen and painting. And that, that was really where I was going. Um, you know, it was not religious Buddhism so much as just Zen, you know, to live a life, live my life. So in any event, one thing led to another, and that you know, um, you know, I ended up going out to Seattle for a year, and um, and that's when um, the great, the second great Buddhist event happened. The first one was uh, meeting Alan Andrews, the summer course in Vermont. The second one was um, getting introduced to Tibetan, to the Tibetan Buddhist 
uh, um, worldview, Tibetan Buddhist practices, and uh, and Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the monastic lifestyle of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so, you know, a long story short, Alan Wallace and Geshe Champa were my two big teachers. I, I was living with Geshe Champa. Uh, he was a full monk. He was a he was a Larampa, a Larampa with distinction. Um, that's worthy of a whole uh, other vlog. But um, but yeah, this all you know this all turned out to be such a a momentous occasion for me because it it was like going from grade school to college. It was that much of a jump. The um, the analysis of the path to enlightenment, you know, the great Lama Chimo, the uh, the jewel ornament of uh, Kenpopa and Pancho Rinpoche's uh, words, of my Lama, you know that whole tradition um, that is throughout and Lama Dre with the Sakya, yeah, and you know the, the, these these approaches towards um, not oriented toward the academics, you know this is for all practitioners. You study and you think and you understand the realities, you know, and and you know in the in, this, in the group, uh, it's the three scopes, the mantra, you know, the partings of attachment, but uh, the uh, the kagyu with the with the jewel ornament, um, they don't break it down into the scopes. It's just you know, it's just graded steps um, all the way, and um, yeah, it was an enormous shock to me. And especially the teachings of Bodhicitta, um, you know, it was, it was like a formal study this time. You know, I knew about, it, you know, the, you get enlightened for the sake of all beings. But, uh, you know, but it was kind of like, sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> it was, now, it was this incredible, uh, rich tradition that the Shatideva, the, uh, the Atisha Shantideva uh, school, uh, you know, what came down to us from the Treya, the Sangha, the Juna, uh, you know, all, all of these practices, viewpoints, you know, the, the depth, you know, relative bodhicitta and absolute bodhicitta, the, um, you know, the, the, this fantastic depth to the Mahayana Sutras, uh, all of this was I, was, I was actually intellectually stunned. Yeah, and um, so I, it, for me, it was like going back to school. And um, I almost got ordained. I missed the ceremony by a day. Yeah. If I had gotten to Dharamsala a day sooner, I could have registered and gotten in. It was with, uh, it would have been with six or seven other guys to be Getzel. Yeah, by his holiness. I don't know what to think about this episode. Yeah. I, I've I've almost gone into therapy about it. You know, how could how could that have happened? You know, did I sabotage myself on that one? Um, and why didn't I go just try to go back and, and get it done anyway? So, you know, why did I turn around and not stay and follow through? So, anyways, yeah, that's part of uh, that's part of the the Buddhist path now for me is uh, reconciling that. Okay, that whole direction of Tibetan Buddhism, you know, the higher motivation of the uh, the Jajuki Sempa, the uh, you know the higher motivation of of, of being bodhicitta driven in terms of your practice, uh, it now becomes social. It becomes uh, you know connected with all beings. You know, you don't you don't sit on your own anymore. Okay. So anyways, can Buddhism be saved? And I say yes. I say yes. And, and what Don's recommendation is, is we need to we need to have a real coming together of the Chan Zen approach of you know living in this world, living with practical methods in this world, here and now, but integrate that with the, the with the great Mahayana principles of Tibet Buddhism, okay, and skillfully, skillfully 
bring in some of the other methods from Tibet. But uh, I think the, 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 you know, that's one of the great dangers of this is that the methods of Tibetan Buddhism are um, extreme. It's like the Sorcerer and the Apprentice, Mickey Mouse. Seriously, I mean, this is powerful stuff. You know, this is not kid stuff. You know, you can go insane. You can get sick. You can develop lung. You can have all kinds of problems, major, major obstacles. And um, so I'm, I'm a little bit fearful of the power of Tibetan Buddhism. But I think if, if, uh, if the Chan and Zen foundation is strong, okay, then this view, the view and practices of Tibet can come in. So it's it's uh, it's going to be a work in progress, and we'll see how it goes. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, in that time I was also studying to become an artist. Little did I know I was studying to become, but that's why I lived with Sai Slong. I literally lived with him, and uh, yeah, he's an interesting. He was in the closet as a gay man, but he he suppressed it. He but he he was at peace with it in a funny kind of way. But if you brought up the subject, he went into gay panic. So um, so all I can say is he was a good example of somebody who compromised with it being gay. But did it in a way that was a little bit harmful because yeah, uh, he did not die well. He was psychologically troubled. He, did, he died a very unhappy man. Um, People, people who know him know what I'm speaking of. But, you know, if he put it aside, you know, he had this big complaint with his mother, uh, something with his mother. And um, I, I personally think it's all part of Sai's problem of being homosexual. He did not accept the fact that he was homosexual. Yeah, that was, I think, the number one issue with him. Uh, but, you know, if, if that stuff was put aside and... And, and he maybe had a glass of wine or something. He was hilarious. You know, he was very cultured, French speaking. He was fluent in French, fluent in Greece and Latin. And uh, he could tell stories. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I've had a good life. I really have. I've met some wonderful people. But those years with Sai, the conversations, the long conversations, uh, you know, we would talk about Cezanne. We talk, we would talk about, you know, all the great French painters, and uh, you know, it's, but Sai was very classically trained as well. I mean, you know, if if Titian came up, or his favorite was that Spaniard uh, El Greco, um, those guys came up, and oh, he just he was in heaven. He loved El Greco. Yeah, that was, yeah, I, I never, yeah, I didn't get into too much of that. I. You know, Cezanne was, was the guy. And then I was getting into abstraction by the time uh, my years ended with Sai. Yeah, it's abstraction, well, you know, Stephen Korn. Stephen Korn was the man. After Cezanne, it was Stephen Korn. But anyways, uh, but Sai, uh, I feel I am part of his lineage. I really do. I, that's, my, that's my final thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, and so I'm feeling that uh, now that I'm, in the one yard line with Oracle, I'm thinking that it's time to uh, come out as a professional artist and just let 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 you know let the chips fall where they may, but just go full bore. Uh, today I had a great day. I um, I um, I did about uh, 12, 12 paintings. You can see those on the ground there. I did about twelve paintings today, all small, real quick. You know, not spending not more than four or five minutes on painting at all, if that. Um, but I did sketch, and I worked from other paintings. I I would sketch shapes. I didn't I didn't copy per se. I used shapes from other drawings and paintings, and I've been doing that more and more. And I think this is something. Think of it as a jazz musician that you know takes up a theme of say a, a Miles Davis theme. Okay, well then he takes it, and then you can play with it and move with it change it, change it around. If you're lucky to have, you know, a partner playing drums and a sax or a bass, you know, then, then rift, get off, get going. Anyways, that's, uh, yeah, so I'm actively engaged now as an artist and uh, 
it was so can Buddhism be said? Yes. Oh, I didn't get the baseball. We could talk about it another day. But America can be saved, yes. If we have good Buddhists, good real people, if we have good real people living real lives, America can be saved. Absolutely. And that's it. Thanks.